So I would like to introduce the first student speaker, Jay, who is an MFA student. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jay Pearl. And so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today, I'll be talking about my project, Agritopias. I am an interdisciplinary designer and strategist, and the subjects that I am interested in exploring and I like to engage with are ones related to ecologies, data, and systems. So the project Agritopias is an experimental agritech project designed in partnership with Prime Produce Seeds to Soil Cooperative. It is a decentralized food network comprising 15 foster food production stations, um, which are adopted by engaged participants. And so that network or system of exchange is documented on the website and the systems that are comprised within this network are essentially a multitude of different variations and are encompassed in scale because it's decentralized and users engage with it as they are able to and at their capacity. And so we see um, a, in partnership with Prime Produce and Seize the Soil, um, they are a key component in this network as they have disseminated resources and tools. And I worked alongside them to kind of build out an infrastructure for this network. And so as we can see here, we have um, several of our growth stations in their different locations, um, New Jersey, Hell's Kitchen, Harlem, Upper West Side, um, and as well as some of the um, available seed stations that are yet to be fostered. And so the idea around this network kind of considers uh, these three different nodes, uh, sourcing, feedback, as well as the infrastructure. Uh, the sourcing is a matter of how close can we get to our food. And I'm not saying how close is your walk up from the nearest Whole Foods, more along the lines of like, how close can we get to where the food is grown? Um, and once we establish a system of sourcing, uh, how are we able to then facilitate feedback on that system? How are we able to engage with participants, share resources and educational tools in order to then um, facilitate a deeper and more systematic and structural um, systems of support, which is uh, facilitated through the infrastructure. And so at the largest scale, we're looking at an aeroponic growth chamber. And through research and testing, um, we wanted to devise a system that allows for optimizing growth um, growing within constrained uh, spaces and systems. And so as a pro part of this process, uh, I was able to conduct research regarding hydroponic systems as well as mycology studies. And so uh, hydroponics is a way of growing uh, food uh, that is done primarily submerged in water. And in an aeroponic system, it's done um, with water but also air. So it's kind of this combination or unique relationship between air and water that enables the plants to still thrive in a non-soil based system. And so uh, this process has enabled me to kind of think about what are the constraints of this system and the capacity of it and how can it then be supported in a cooperative framework um, at Prime Produce and Seize to Soil. And so uh, through these, this testing and this exchange of resources, um, I've been a facilitator of kind of conducting um, tests on hydroponic systems and the ways in which they can kind of further support this community and further support the larger scale infrastructure. And so in supplement to um, the hydroponic system, we're looking at mycology, which also further interfaces with some of the infrastructures at Prime Produce. Um, and most of a, a mushroom chamber with Cornell, um, we had to kind of decentralize that system as well uh, as a result of COVID-19. And so these mushroom box were disseminated to a variety of different participants throughout the city as well. Um, and were a part of this cultivation process that was documented and being able to kind of know um, what was successful or what wasn't successful um, in order within certain types of growing systems and constraints enabled us to kind of further um, user engagement into this network as well as kind of think about what ways can we continue to further um, our ability to produce food in a hyper-localized capacity. So now looking at how this scales down even further. So while the aeroponic system is the largest implementation, the seed station that I had overseen was a slightly smaller implementation 
um, hydroponic materials as well as a lot of those resources are not readily accessible or available to people. And so um, thinking about infrastructure that can be implemented along the lines to kind of engage that, um, engage people who don't have that access, um, resulted in a tiny plot infrastructure, which is administered by CSU Soil Cooperative um, on site at Prime Produce. And so the tiny plots infrastructure um, is designed um, and was put into play by a host of different volunteers, which enabled uh, users to be able to grow their own food in these localized um, pots. So they can grow them at home, they can grow them in their office, um, in turn being able to kind of have a more fluctuating system of growth support um, using upcycled milk crates. And so the idea is that once the capacity or yield goes extends beyond an individual capacity or the milk crates are not able to host um, a plant as large or as uh, plentiful as its yield may become, it then is able to then become transported back into the system. So um, this network is grounded in principles of mutual aid and support in order to kind of combat uh, food injustice and environmental injustice that inhibits uh, food accessibility for individuals. So when we um, enact uh, or implement these tiny plots at a hyper-local civic level, in turn, we're hoping that the yield can then go back into the community and then continue to um, essentially yield even more fruits um, of its labor, I guess, um, no pun intended, but essentially that those resources would also go back out into the community as well in like the cyclical uh, capacity. And all of which um, this project is basically a project that prioritizes community engagement and community-based uh, art practice and systems of support. And so we're interfacing with different um, practitioners, individuals, and organizations um, and allowing for a platform in which to host those voices. So through Technically Delicious um, is a zine platform where we're engaging with food activists as well as uh, practitioners, artists who are able to engage with uh, systems relating to ecologies and how to kind of create a more environmentally just world um, through the lens of food. And so when we want, look at how we're engaging, um, our upcoming talks um, are with Tiga Brain, Assistant Professor of Integrated Digital Media at New York University. Uh, she has uh, worked the Processing Foundation, and a lot of the work that she does is regarding uh, data systems and infrastructures within capitalism that also pertain to uh, the environment and how that relationship between capitalism and the environment is at play. Um, and in addition, we'll also be engaging with Nancy Denise of Augmented Architecture, uh, and she uses uh, mycelium, um, which is the network of a mushroom network of uh, mushroom. And she uses that as a sustainable material in her practice and also engages in um, essentially speculative or installation design um, that kind of talks about these relationships to ourselves and our environment as well. And so um, when we look at this idea or this thought of a utopia, um, essentially we're, lo we're looking at how participants at a ground and level and at a hyper civic level can create change uh, fostering and fostering that change through community. So yeah, uh, thank you so much, and I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much, Jay. Now I would like to introduce Bex, who is a BFA student. Hello, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Perfect. All right, so let us start. So hi everyone, um, my name is Bex. I am a BFA student in design and technology. And I guess today I'll be talking to you about my thesis project, which is called Octo Hugs. And it's a huggable plush toy that um, I created for my thesis project. So first I wanted to start off with my big question that kind of led my project. So my big question was like, how could I create a huggable plush toy that could support and soothe children with developmental disabilities while they're in times of frustration or times when they're feeling upset? So I ended up with Octo Hugs. Here's my classmate, Ash, um, demonstrating how they hug the octopus. And um, I just want to show you this quick video on how 
it works. So when you hug the lights, the light will shine and the sounds of bubbles will play and there's also a version that includes vibration so a bit of haptic feedback there um and to begin i want to talk about like the research and the precedents because i think my journey with creating octo hugs is just really important to how it ended up becoming um to be and so of course my research involved toys so i looked at like what are the stimulating toys in the market um which included these gel mats, the fidget spinner, motion bubblers, toys of this sort. Um, but I also looked at toys that were marketed towards hugs or cuddles, um, toys that were more about, oh, like come hug and squish me, uh, which was really awesome to look at and lovely to go to toy stores and get to fill a bunch of toys. Uh, then I continued and looked really a lot at sensory rooms. And specifically, I found myself in a tunnel of mom blogs where I was looking at these moms sharing, you know, how they created their sensory rooms for their children. Um, and so I was looking like, how could I emulate this idea of a do-it-yourself like sensory room since every child has their different likes and dislikes and different things that make them relax. Um, and so I was really looking at like, how these other these different sensory moods have been created, um, and at the end of my research, by after reading, looking at toys, looking at sensory rooms and mom blogs, um, every child is different, right? And so I wanted to somehow capture that into my toy. And so we'll continue with looking at my prototypes that I created. So first, I made an octopus, and it started off with literally four legs um, that I just tied together, <laughs> and then it went on to how do I test the sensor? Um, this is a pressure sensor on the side, left side of the screen. And then looking more into what is the fabric that I want to use. I went to fabric stores, felt fabric, um, really liked the feeling of this simpling and also had people test out fabric and had them test like what, you know, soft fabric felt even better for them. And so this was Octo Hugs at the end of my first semester, so in December of last year. And then it also involved testing the stuffing for my prototypes. So there's a difference between having a little bit of stuffing, having it, you know, the legs stuffed up, the toy stuffed up, and also having, you know, weighted beads with the stuffing. And so I was also testing this throughout the process decided to go for the middle, um, not too little, not a lot of stuffing, but it's overstuffed. Um, and, but I also really liked testing the weighted beads just because for some children, they really enjoy that weighted feeling, um, but decided to go against it when I learned that in the United States, if you get your child a weighted toy or have it in school, it technically has to come like with a note from an occupational therapist. So I didn't really want to deal with <laughs> those legalities for this current iteration. Um, and then I went and play tested with children and my classmates and I interviewed and like met with a bunch of people. And so I just want to show you a few of the things that I got from kindergarten through third grade classes. Um, so these children were right in like my target audience and I first gave them a prompt to draw a toy that they wanted to hug. So I got a bunch of cool responses. This is a huggable whale. This is a rainbow that comes with its own environment from its cell. This is Daisy and Octopus. Um, and then we have here the trio Hoppy, Poppy, and Loppy, which are these like pink and purple rabbits, which are super cute. Uh, I also gave these children a second prompt. So I said, okay, now I want you to design an octopus toy that you would want to hug. Um, and so I gave them the basic octopus shape and they went all out with their designing. So here's a galaxy octopus with ears and flower crown and, you know, a little unicorn horn, a lot going on here with galaxy. Then we got a lot of IP. So a lot of characters that these toys already, or that these children already love, like Pikachu, extra legs included. And here we have an octopus that Maylene drew and she drew this octopus with a bunch of she put a bunch of pom-poms on it which was really fun and none of the other kids went and got materials outside of um colors so this was really great to see 
And then here we have Valentin and he decided to draw an octopus like himself, which was really sweet to see because, you know, some kids want to see themselves in their toys. And so it was really great that he drew, you know, the glasses and the braces and he even drew a cast on the octopus because he had a cast at the time. Um, so it was really lovely being able to interact with these kids and being able to see from them like what they would want to see from a toy. And along with meeting with children, I also decided that I needed to talk to people in the field. So I talked to Nancy. She's a special ed teacher. She was very lovely and very helpful for me in the beginning stages. I also talked to my lovely mother, who's an elementary school teacher here in Los Angeles. Um, so it was really great to talk to them. I also went to the New York Toy Fair this year and I talked to a whole bunch of people who were super helpful. Um, I didn't take Octohugs to Toy Fair, but I did show uh, some of these people like videos and pictures and they were all very helpful and encouraging in my process of creating Octohugs. And so since the, you know, pandemic struck, I was going to do playtesting, couldn't do that had to think of something else that I wanted to focus my time on. So I decided to focus on a custom online buying experience for Octohugs. And so here we have kind of like the landing page and you would click the arrow to go to the home page where you can see if you scroll down, you would see um, some more info about Octohugs itself. You could also go to the about page. And here I really want to include like on a custom buying experience, you see that like this toy was created from scratch and it started with a simple idea. Um, and then we go to the actual area where you can customize your Octo Hugs. And so you first can choose the color or you can choose whether you want vibration or not, um, whether you want the sounds or no sound because every child is different, right? Some kids did not like the sounds at all, which is totally fine, but they love the idea of seeing something light up. Um, and then the last one being the lights. And I wanted it to be like at the end, you see your product um, with all the customizations included. And so, which I think brings me back to my central idea that like every child is different and that really is what led my project. And I think Octo Hugs turned out really cool. And I think in the future, what I really would like to continue working on is play testing with children and seeing if I could um, get this product somewhere, even if it's just on like an Etsy shop or something. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening to me talk about Octo Hugs, and I hope you are doing well and you can learn more on my thesis site. Thank you so much, Bex. Now I would like to introduce Bohan, who is a MFA student. One, two. Hello, everybody, and a good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. And my name is Bohan Chen, and today I'm going to present my thesis project about an AI framework for first responder in disaster emergency decision making. So a little thing about me, my name is Bohan, and uh, I'm a UX UI designer as well as a product designer. I'm a tech enthusiast. I love about technology, also love history. I try to learn debate because I always lost. And you can learn more things about me on my website. And so the inspiration of this, my project is during my summer internship, I met a colleague who is a survivor actually from 2008 Sichuan earthquake. And here are some photos about him. And uh, I kind of briefly talked the story with him about that experience. And uh, this was quite shocking and quite surprised. And uh, I kind of feel like the vulnerable, like of all people, like during the natural disaster, like what are the things that he cannot accomplish? All the decisions he made, like the way that he lost his arm is really follow the human instinct. So, and it's totally tragedy. It's a catastrophe. And uh, so many people die, a lot of people are missing, a lot of people are injured. So, and I doing following research on the natural disaster, I see it's not something that we can be solved right now. And the problem still exists because we are facing more natural disasters every day. And there are more people need like immediately assistance right away. So how can you do about it? So, and then I bring my professions into design because there's something, there are some codes that I learned over the summer that by Thomas J. Watson, 
that design must reflect a practical and ethical in business, but above all, good design must primarily serve people. So how can I solve this problem for them? How can I tackle this real world problem for people? So I start with domain research for natural disaster. I attend a workshop on TOEFL code, which is hosted by IBM. And uh, we invite a few responders from BSR to give us uh, introductions about the scenario about during the natural disaster rescue missions. And I received those pain points, the unreliable on technology, the difficult time to find people like to find people in a short period of time, the fragile of the road infrastructures, lack of way to document disaster reports, all those problems are, not, are under the way to solve this. And then go back to look at the documentary, look at the photograph. Like for the people who cannot receive the information, they have to send a military jumping from the sky, from the parachute to retrieve the information because they cannot have data. They don't have information yet 10 years ago. And they still don't have it because everything they do are still rely on a dog to find the missing persons. So how can I use technology to change it? Can I implement a new way to help first responder to provide them a new directions to solve this problem. So, and then those more res I found more research to support this, my argument. Like it's hard to make decisions, everything's on the fly. And uh, while looking at the current framework about natural disaster monitoring, there's so many usability issues, overwhelming information, overwhelming data. It's hard to use. You cannot retrieve insight. So the first responder are not using them. So, and then I'm moving forward to a technology research to looking for answers. So I start with my AI domain research to try to understand artificial intelligence, try to understand this emerging technology. So I see the opportunity in, uh, in AI because according to this report from OpenAI, uh, the, the computational power is keep increasing in the past, will be double the seven times in the past few years. And so there's a big chance that people can use AI to solve big real world problems. But the way that we are using AI is also debatable. Like we use them to monitoring children, education, to, to see if they are paying attention in the classroom. Is this really a good way to look at AI? So I worked to the workshop about the design, uh, during the uh, AI research week at MIT. And I know some designer and researcher from in this field, and I kind of have a basic understanding how can I design AI framework ethically to solve problem for first responder. That is based on this but AI ethics framework. I need to think about fairness, explanatory, robustness, and transparency. So after I finished all this feature, I came down to a mind mapping process to organize everything I have and put everything on the board to think about the directions I can go. And then thinking about the EDM case reasoning, which is part of decision making, I think about the other domain I need to consider in this project. So, and then I come down into a basic framework that I want to do a both a software design as well as a hardware improvement. And then I kind of drop down to the idea and put them on a prioritization grade to find a thing that I really want to focus on. So I really want to focus on the decision making system concept design, as well as the support with some hardware. And then some like earthquake domain I also want to cover. There's so many natural disasters. I'm trying to cover everything, but in terms of this demo, I just want to go maybe earthquake as my main scenario. And also want to consider the people like into my system, like who are we actually using the system? So I come up with a stakeholder map. There will be subject matter experts who will maintain the system as well as there is a response team who are divided into the field first responder and the responder leader. And the responder leader are the person who are use my system and they help to accomplish these missions. And then moving forward with some hardware experiment, I try to program a drone to do the object detections with node red. And I'm doing some experiment to prove the feasibility that I can improve the drone for the first responder and use that to detect a destroyed building as well as a detect build, intact building. So this kind of bring a new framework that I want to have a monitoring conditions and as well as retrieving data from the hardware, from the technology, to help improve the uh, uh, systems over time. And this leads to the end framework that about how this framework will collaborate 
uh, between each stakeholder and how can I train and define the model, how can I make the model more robust and uh, help the first responder to make the decisions after a natural disaster happened. And this comes by final system design that after a disaster happened, you log into the system, you'll pick up your role about if you are first responder or you are SME. If you are SME, your major, uh, your main responsible responsibility is to manage the database. And here you can see where the data coming in and how what AI model they are using to for the first response to make the decisions. And then is you can also go into the deeper for SME to see how the uh, AI model actually work. And here is an example using Basin Network for the case reasoning based on the past event to help first responders make decisions in the fly. And for the first responder scenario, it's about um, on the monitoring of all the conditions worldwide and going into a single disaster view. For example, in this case, like after he can choose the filter through the disaster he want to see or receive the alert, he can click on the disaster with the highest priority. And in this case, it's a Sichuan earthquake. And he can check with a single view of the natural disaster to see the condition and what's going on, some predictions, how many people are infected, and what are some following disaster will happen in the futures. And based on this data, he can start to use the system to make a project plan. And based on the model and the database he choose, he can come up and the system will provide a generated report, like where the people are mostly be damaged and where are some potential consequences. And also provide some recommended action. In this case, it's adding a drone to the system. And uh, then the field responder will send out the drone footage to the to the to the leaders, and uh, he will use this new data to come up with a new project plan in the future. And uh, after this final prototype, you know, I receive a lot of help from my friends to use our testing it, and also receive some new feedback from first responder to give me some opinions about how they think about the drone and how they think about the system. And uh, they are really, really helpful. And I'm looking forward to further develop this project. And uh, I'm, if this is like MVP, minimal viable products, but I really want to in the future to make a working prototype. And, do, and so the first responder can actually really use when the next disaster happen. So that's really summarized my presentation today. I would like to see thank to all my professors in the DT. I will thank my physics professor. I would thank John, Kyle, Sven for giving me the positive mental attitude in the past two years. Special thanks to all my mentors and special thanks to my DT and my friends and my family. And uh, to, in conclusions, I would say this is the end of the beginning. They had both risk and opportunities and everything will be all right. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Bohan. Now I would like to introduce Lionel, who is a BFA student. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so I, my name is Lionel, and I am a graduating BFA student. And I'd like to talk to you today about the American Electoral College. Now, I did a research project last year that revealed how the Electoral College of the United States, in my own words at the time, perpetuated the erasure of many votes of citizens. This is due to many things, including the layout of states' electoral districts and un as well as unreliable voting mechanisms. I found research that correlated one's power of choice to their happiness level, which I deemed important enough to pursue for a whole year at the project. And I'm equating the, the one's power of choice to their voting power. So this journey has brought me to where I am today with this project. The statistic that has spurred me to the, mo the most towards completion of my thesis is this one. The fact that the American Electoral College has an error rate of 11%. Five out of the 45 American presidents have been elected into office even after losing the popular vote. That is to say, the majority of voting citizens place their vote in favor of one of the opposition members. 
in my aforementioned research paper, I equated the action of voting to placing trust into. And so this means that when the person who holds the greatest power in, uh, in a country does not hold the trust of the majority of its citizens, that person's ideals and the decisions that they make while they're in office do not reflect the ideals of the majority of the American public. This is very important to me because it, it, it affects their happiness levels at a mass, a massive scale. The main message I'd like to send to my, my work is we have to change the US's voting system on a fundamental level in order to address this. And to highlight that, that I'd like to, I decided to focus on a few alternative voting systems that we might be able to use and that are in use around the world as well to examine their and compare and contrast them against our current first past the post system. Now, don't get me wrong, changing our voting system is, would hardly fix the entire problem, but it's a good start and it would allow, for, allow further things to be implemented to, toward the systematic change. So this is where my project comes in. Change the vote is an interactive narrative. In it, the user chooses set responses to converse in a chat room like Discord or Slack with characters who embody the personalities of these alternative voting systems. Now that's a lot to unpack in one sentence. So let's reiterate. As a user, you are guided along a fairly set path on rails Every so often a choice comes up and you are meant to choose one in, in order to say something to the other characters in this chat room. Over the course of this narrative, you're going to be introduced to these new characters um, and you will develop relationships with them. In, and through these story events and through crises happening in their fictional lives, you will be prompted at the end of that to first of all, vote in the coming 2020 election, and second of all, be prompted to date one of these characters. And through the action of dating, you'll, it, you'll essentially be saying, oh, I like this voting system the best. And as you can see in this, in this slide here, uh, bots exist in the server as well, in this fake server as well, to help ease the introduction process and to help educate the user. In this instance, the character of Uncle Sam is trying to introduce himself to you and this bot comes in and, and tries to ease the, the introduction by introducing you to the first past the post system who Uncle Sam represents. In addition to first past the post system in which you can only choose one candidate, you'll be able to interact with the characters of approval vote, the system in which you can choose multiple candidates and ranked choice vote in the system in which you can rank your choices, first, second, and so on, and in addition to plenty of other cameos. Throughout this narrative, characters will throw out controversial, controversial statements as well, and some of it will, might, be in, might be disputed by a neutral bot, a fact checker bot character. This character will guide the user on the right path towards enlightenment or towards in education, I should say, and by providing bipartisan online sources to help them and to prompt self-induced research as well on the topics that I'm presenting. So if you came here for answers, I'm afraid I have no real solution for the problem of a broken electoral system. Well, my research tells me that our current system is not doing the best job it can, I have yet to uncover a, or, or design a new system that might provide the best kind of support. What I can do is say what my intent is, and that is to raise awareness about this phenomenon and to educate the masses really on the inner workings of our the electoral college and the first past the post voting system. I like to educate voters, both veteran ones and new ones who are interacting with this system for the first time and provide users with a toolkit that they can use so that they can refer to it when they're confronted with an, a situation that can help us be change our voting system for the better. So, and also I should mention in, in my projects, um, 
it's available online. That was a, a major hallmark of one of the first things that I, I wanted to do was have avail be available online for everyone and on mobile as well, so that it's more accessible to the general public. And when you open it, you'll find a library of online resources that can help you, that, can, that are available at your fingertips um, to further contextualize the project and to further, further your education, really. Thank you for listening and stay safe. Thank you so much, Lionel. Now I would like to introduce Akshansh, who is a MFA student. Dear citizens of the world, I am Akshansh, an MFA Design and Technology student at Parsons. What you are about to see is my personal expression into how I perceive privacy and why I think it is essential. The idea behind Signature is to make users understand that there is something powerful about making informed decisions. As you enter the experience, think about the choices that are being made. Why are those being made? What's happening because of that? Question everything around you. This piece is personal to me and I expect it to be insightful for you. Let's experience together.
Hmm. What you saw was my take on expressing the importance of personal data. I wanted you to understand that privacy is based on the actions a user takes every day. And those actions have consequences, some that are visible directly and others that are hidden. I see them myself. If I say Instagram right now and uh, then I say Twizzlers, then a few hours later I'll get an advertisement about Twizzlers on Instagram. And I would expect it to be there. So there's an association with how my actions led to the use of my personal information. Such observations gave birth to this thesis project. The audio in the experience starts with a crowd noise that disappears as soon as a person wears a headset. I chose VR because it allows for that distraction-free environment. Inside VR, I wanted to express the topic of personal data through a metaphor of changing data level. The idea was that as users interact in the space, they would develop real-world associations with their choices. Choose more data and the level rises, and choose less data and the level falls. The visual correspondences were the reason for not making the project look lifelike. Um, in the wake of the global pandemic, I've had a change in perspective. Suddenly, I'm uh, more willing to share personal information. My thoughts were replicated in the art. As you saw, each company had a unique visual style and presentation. The logo of Facebook, for instance, had a stark distinctive look because I had sketched it in January, whereas Google's logo was realistic because I had sketched it in April. I am someone who has transitioned from products, services, procedures, customers, to emotions, causes, social issues, and cultures. These are the kind of terms that were not there in my vocabulary. That transition made me realize that there was so much depth and content in the world to appreciate and empathize with. I liked the addition of emotion in my work. Through Signature, I became an informed citizen first and then I became a privacy advocate. This project and my experience at Parsons have established me as an individual. Thanks for experiencing it with me. Thank you so much, Akshansh. Now I would like to introduce Ming, who is also an MFA student. Hi. Hi everyone, my name is Ming Ma. I'm going to uh, talk about my thesis uh, project Samata. And before that, I want to thanks to my instructors, um, Matty, Andrew, Hapre, and uh, Loretta. So before I start with my uh, thesis project, I want to introduce a little bit about myself. Before I came to DT, I was studying fine arts, and this is the installation called 2002 I made in my undergrad uh, in the senior year. It's my first time to um, build this interactive uh, installation and it's my first time to see people interact with my art and not just see my art and um, that made me so happy and that led me to DT and this is called Mochichi I made in my major studio too and um, this is an emotional support sculpture that uh, when you pet it it will give you feedback by um, light up the eyes and also um, the vibrations so my um, most of my work are very um, playful and I want to bring people this um, happy and um, joyful moments. So for my thesis, I want to make it even more playful. So I decided to design a toy that enhance the playful moment and facilitate an unexpected interaction for the users. 
So my users are adults because there are so many toys out there, but not many toys for adults. And most of the adults, they buy and click um, designer toys. They won't play with it. Them, they will just um, buy it because of the value of the um, designers or the artists. So um, I really think play is a crucial part of the learning process. And we see a lot of the educators uh, emphasize on how children can learn to play. However, we see play dramatically decreasing in adulthood. If this is an essential part of our cognitive growth, why is it not being exercised as much among adults? As adults, we are taught to focus more on things that are supposedly important, such as jobs, school works, or social commitments. Often the importance of play is being ignored and lost in many young adults' life. So in my thesis, I decided to create this music uh, musical toy. I made this in my thesis one. It's called Melolo. I designed the form and I explored the material and I even put um, musical components inside it and test with um, many users and I even made a um, music video and a face filter for Melolo but from this I see a very important part is missing um, with Melolo that is the playful moment um, because I want it it be a play for a toy but Melolo is just like another designer toy and I add um, some interaction into it. So in my thesis uh, studio two, I, I decided to totally change the form. I just go back to my research and I see those um, um, very um, famous and amazing child toy like Lego, wooden block, or Chinese tongram. They are uh, all have like simple shapes, but uh, children can build it into any form or any skill they want with no limitations. And that is what I want in my toy, Samantha. Samantha. Samantha is a musical toy which allows people to build into any form they desire. When users combine the five parts and play with the final uh, form they created, it will have random sounds come out. And the goal of Samantha is to bring people an open-ended, unlimited creative journey and encourage them to explore the endless possibilities through the experience of creating music with simple toys. And next, I'm, I'm going to show you a video of how to play with Samantha. share you uh, with my journey of finding the form of Samantha. And these two images are the very early age, uh, early stage of um, the, the prototype of Samantha. And at the beginning, I was so um, um, lost and I don't know um, 
I don't know what to where to start because to change a lot from Melolo to Samantha is a very big change. And this is the uh, second prototype. I I because I really don't know. I even want to step back. But this prototype is just like another Melolo with like marshmallow like. I just add like five other different elements with it. But what I've learned from this prototype is that I, I find out I can use magnet to con connect the, them together. And I even like um, try to explore with those uh, simple geometry shapes like, um, uh, but, but it's just too obvious to see those uh, geometry shapes. So I want to make it a little more abstract. I have this prototype. Um, they are very abstract, uh, abstract, abstract, but um, they just don't seem they have connection with each other. I still find, feel like something is missing from this prototype. Then I feel like maybe I should add some symbol to make it look like a creature when they create together in the final. I So I add some like uh, horn-like um, elements uh, or tail-like tail elements but uh, when it come out, it it I took I decide to change it because the goal of Samantha is to invite the users to an unlimited creative journey. I didn't want to make a toy resemble any specific creature or objects. That's why I think it's important to make it the form more abstract. So in my final form of Samantha, I took the horns and the tails like form out. And this is the final form of Samantha. And this is how it looks like. So for now, I want to share a little bit um, the journal of me to finding the sound for Samantha. Um, when I think about musical toy, the first thing I will think, oh, maybe I should make it connect with emotion because uh, sound is, when I think about sound, I can directly think about emotion. But when I do research and do the test, I find out uh, it's really hard to detect people's um, um, emotion reflect on sound. So I, I give up on this part. Then I start to explore sound with uh, surrounding daily life objects. But then I thought it's really hard to generate emotion connections um, to find them sound. That is why I started creating theory, which is pentatonic scale. This scale it has it has five notes, and no matter in what order you play, these five notes will come out as harmonious. But I don't want to just make another um, music uh, like instrumental toy. So I asked my cousin, she's very good at singing and good at music. I asked her to change, uh, to transform this uh, pentatonic scale into a uh, uh, like creature-like voice, which is like this. So that's the sound and the technical part I use uh, processing and Arduino uh, uh, and also the Preso sensor to control the toy. In the future, I wish I can put those uh, components into my um, Samota. And I wish I can see people um, play with it and, and create into any form they want to use their um, imagination and create creativity. Or I wish I can see it into maybe into a ga gallery to see a lot of people together to use the meta to um, do a small um, concert like performance. And also, I want to share um, how the Samantha, Samantha name came out um, because I really like this undersea creature, sea butterflies, and it has another name. It's called Teco Samantha. And I just took the Samantha parts, and also I found out Samantha is also a, a name of a sale. I found out it really matches um, my toy. Like you can combine these different form, uh, different parts together to create a form, and that's it. Thank you.
thanks uh, to everyone. And also uh, feel free to reach out to me through my email or um, my Instagram. Um, welcome to play my face filters. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Ming. Now, for the last student speakers of the night, I would like to introduce Fan and Roy, who worked on a joint project together, and they are both MFA students. Hello. Hey, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're catching. So, yes, we are catching. So here's Kashin with Alfred and Zoo. Let's watch the promotion video. <laughs> introduce ourselves a lot of it from the first beginning. So my name is Roy. I'm in charge about UX design, UI design, branding, motion graphic, video shooting based on this project. And you can find me on my profile website down below. My name is Fama Ring. I'm the UX designer and also business strategist behind this project. And here comes our journey with MasterCards. So after talking with Mascard, and uh, here comes to potential topics we can go forward. And we narrow down to one question is, how might we leverage data to make student life experience much better on campus? And uh, we then want to focus on two main points. One is about payments, and the second one is about loyalty. And then our target group user are Gen Z from 18 to 22 years old. Why Gen Z? Because Gen Z is a growing market, 26% uh, in US population, and they have a sp uh, large spending power. Next one is we also find out that Gen Z are mostly are using digital wallets. So that comes to our uh, interactive design. And uh, what we find is 6% of uh, Gen Z are using credit cards, which opens up a huge business opportunity. Um, OK, that's fine. And um, maybe you have a bad connection. So based on the research before, here comes the business model. So as a foundation from MasterCard, MasterCard gave Kaching the authority to build up the whole connection. And also you can see the triangle here. This is totally have the connection between student, merchants, and school. Students gonna enjoy the benefit from merchants and also merchants can gain a lot of customer by the student group of people. And also school can have a collaboration with merchants as well. And also uh, school can serve internal information and also benefit with students. And here comes the architect here. We can see Rick, Ricky Wu. Ricky Wu is a recent graduate per, per student from Parsons. And you can see there's a lot of pain points down below. Overspending when he feels stressful. Can now get credit card because of no credit history. And also, he had always forgot of uh, paying back his credit card. It hurt his credit score a lot. And also, based on the language barrier, he always feels confusing about it. And based on the architect, we narrowed it down to the pain points here. So, first of all, student to cool. 
all too shy to asking for the student discount. And also international students who even don't have the authority during the first page, don't have the authority to have a credit card. And also students are super manful, stressful to dealing with finance. And also students who even don't have the foundation knowledge by dealing with finance as well. And on the top, it's gonna be students are feeling like the existing financial application inside the market are too uncool to use. And here comes our concept statement. Kashin is an integrated financial platform aimed to empower Gen Z, adopt healthy personal finance habits, as well as other students' benefit in a fun, engaging, and relaxing matters. And here comes Kajin. So I would like to highlight some functionality here. First of all is all the layer up information. And you can see we layered it up. Kajin never gonna serve the wrong amount of information. Serving the right amount of information is really important for Kajin. Information overall is totally a no-no. And eventually we're gonna show our user the recent activity, even by a hidden way. You can always see the detail by clicking the button down below. And Kaching Zhu cares about users' needs here. By tailoring about users' needs, for example, the program keys, you can see all the internal information and find out internal discount inside of this channel. And also you can customize it by yourself as well. By simply input your student card number, you can travel in a, around the shopping channel. You can see tons of Gen Z friendly brands here and also enjoy the student discount. Just to take advantage from us. And we too care not even only finance and also mental health situation, especially during this special period of time. COVID-19, we are here with you together. By singly serving you the in-exhale in -exhale functionality, let's take a breathing exercise. Just to stage all the bad energy away. We can do that. And let's talk a little bit about the digital channel here. Data visualization is totally a highlight functionality instead of coaching. By traveling through around 3D to 2D dimensional channel, you can see all the information down below. All right, let's jump into the demo part. So let's click the button and then we jump into Kachin. First is the first time user tutorial. You can see all the functionality, swiping card down and up to have the submit code and join into the all right, register. And then you're gonna verify your coaching card and input your program name. And you can see the hidden CVV code and also find your student ID and barcode there. And then to customize the channel and jump into the program keys. Wow, you can see all the program benefit here. And also the internal events. Some of them are even free to offer them to our users and then jump into the financial page. You can see the, by spending to earn, you can see the points and also the graphic chart here as well. It's totally crystal clear to show our users the data. And then let's take a breathing exercise. I speed up this functionality just so willing to show the time. So inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale again. All right, hold in. So how do you feel? <laughs> and then, yeah, let's jump into the FICO score. All right, it seems like I do pretty good. And then, yeah, let's go to the shopping channel and see all the Gen Z friendly brands here. What about fashion channel? Okay, yeah, let's go to the tech channel. All right, maybe go to this, get this cup, coupon code ready, serving for you and then loading into the brand page. Okay, here we go. 
maybe later. And then let's just uh, mark it. So you can find it inside of the case here. As once you click inside, you can find here. And also you can select it. All right, let's go to the duration page. So you can always change in your duration date, not only in put, and also you can click the calendar here to simply change your duration date. We empower you. Hey, Roy, I'm so sorry. We're almost out of time, so you can keep right, right, right. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, this is a profile page. And then this is the whole journey. All right, and last but not least, I'd like to thank you for our supervisor, Evan from MasterCard, and also Hapri, Loretta, Chris, and Ethan gave us tons of helps. And also thank you, Stuart, Oman, and Yang give us help as well. All right, thank you guys. Thank you so much, everyone, for all the wonderful presentations. Now, I would like to move on to the Q&A session of the night. Um, the Q&A will be moderated by Marika Yuritsma. It would go on for 15 minutes. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to take questions from the chat. Um, a gentle reminder that if you're not speaking, please mute and turn off your video to improve stream quality. Now, to introduce Marika. Marika Yurisma is a creative technologist who explores ways of using emergent technologies and science to build non-traditional electronic instruments and software. She is currently a senior user experience designer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where she designs software for robotic space exploration. Her projects include designing augmented reality tools for spacecraft engineering and Mars exploration and designing processes and software to support spacecraft exploration for the Europa Clipper, Clipper mission. She's also a professor at the California Institute of the Arts. Marika, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me. What a wonderful uh, presentation. Congratulations to all of you who are graduating. Um, it's a really impressive body of work. And I feel honored to be asked to um, lead this Q&A. So I'm, I'm going to go through, I hope I can get through all of these questions. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. My first question is for Jay Pearl. Um, Jay, I was really interested in your project, specifically how it proposes this idea of bringing us back to the way that food is produced. Now, um, I don't believe, given my current working situation that if I had to actually produce my, all of my own food, that I would have time to maintain that. But I think what you're proposing is that we kind of design new communities um, that are based on a new form, a new form of production and distribution. So what I'm curious about is in your work, um, what kind of emergent societies and cultures you discovered uh, in your user testing? What a wonderful question. Uh, thank you for asking it. And so I think one of the most interesting aspects, like culturally that I ended up encountering, um, I used to attend poetry luncheons um, every Wednesday um, on a weekly basis. And that kind of led to kind of me thinking about food as like a transformative space. Um, and so thinking about alternative ways in which people from, at Prime, yeah, it was at Prime Produce, sorry. <laughs> um, thinking about these different um, ways and spaces in which people can come together and through something as um, like poetry, people can kind of come together and then think about the food that they eat um, and share parts of themselves in that space as well. Thank you so much. I love... Um I love your acknowledgement of the role of food and culture sort of interacting um, and also the and the way that you extend that by including 
the role with the artist in your project. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Bex about the Octo Hugs. Um, my question is about um, your decision to come up with uh, the configurations that, uh, that the children could choose for the creation of their um, huggable Octo, octo Hugs. Um, I'm curious about how you came up with the idea to use the three specific colors, um, the vibration or no vibration and the ocean sounds. Yeah, so I guess the actual different parts of the feedback, so having the vibration, having the sounds and the lights came from my inspiration, one of the precedents being sensory rooms. Um, and when testing them out with kids, they seem to react well to it. At least, you know, some kids like some things over others. Um, and particularly pertaining to the colors, um, I asked these kids like what colors they like. And it also came up a lot through their drawings, um, which colors they kind of lean towards for these toys. Um, so I kind of chose from there um, a smaller collection. Eventually, in the end, I would like there to be, you know, more color choices because some kids would like to see more of like maybe a purple or more of a green color. Um, but for this certain um, particular iteration of Octo Hugs, I stuck with those colors since they came up the most through my research. Um, and yeah, with the ocean sounds particularly, I wanted it to kind of relate to an octopus. Um, and the feedback that I got from children, they seemed to like the ocean sounds in a sense. Um, so I think maybe in the future, if there could be more sounds so kids can choose which sound they like and play them, um, that would be more ideal. So would you say that your decisions are kind of guided by both research, but also your means of production and that you don't have the means to produce every possible color at this yeah. moment? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, that's interesting. And what's the next steps for production and distribution? So I think next steps would be to work further with children after everything, you know, calms down with uh, the pandemic, because I really wanted to get more into the playtesting with kids. And I've already play tested with my target audience and children with developmental disabilities. Um, so I would like to go further with that. And I have contacted like some schools in the Bronx who um, would love to play test. So I think that's my next step. Great, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. My next question is for Bohan um, and his disaster emergency decision-making system. Um, it's the research on your project is so incredibly impressive and I love following uh, the process that you went through. There were some things that you posted, I took screenshots of because they're very relevant to the work that I do with um, artificial intelligence. So Bohan, I was curious um, with all of this planning that you've done and these ideas that you come up with, what do you think the riskiest assumptions about your project are since you are just at the point where you would start introducing it in testing, um, what are you going to be looking specifically to test for? Uh, well, I think I will answer this question through two perspectives. Uh, one thing is from the hardware, and uh, the hardware is basically the reliable of the technology. And uh, basically it's a data accurate, is the information you receive is uh, correct. And uh, it is a live update. And uh, so these are really depends on a lot of factors because one of the thing based on my interview, the, the reason that the first responder still rely on dog or puppy and uh, to find a missing person after natural disaster because technology like uh, radar or ultrasonic and they require specific condition to make them to work. So I think like the challenge to implement this design system in the future is uh, one thing is definitely the hardware reliability. But I would say like with the future coming like future with potential 5G and 6G, when the internet speed getting faster and the sensor getting smaller, it will become a new trend definitely. I have I'm strong belief in this gonna be happen. And from the software, I think it's more about how people are gonna use AI and uh, is the AI robust enough and uh, is the data accurate 
do, can we eliminate all the biases? Can we trust the result of the AI? And I think those are the really the, some broad challenges we have. And for more technical challenging is how can I in integrate into those miscellaneous pieces all together? Because the one challenging, one problem I found is all the system right now are fragmented. So and what I'm trying to do here is come up with an integrated system. But in order to do an integrated system, we are trying to connect the dot all together. So I think that would be another challenge I will face. Um, I have a follow-up question for you. So um, assuming that we at some point get to a part with the technical hardware and with the um, web capabilities and the AI models um, are highly performant, there's still always this unexpected element of how whether users are going to adopt it, especially with AI. There's questions mm -hmm. of trust and a need for transparency. So I'm wondering in, the, in more of the user realm, if you have any questions, say say you did a um, a testing session where you faked everything, so everything was essentially running perfect. What might be challenges to what challenges to adoption do you um, foresee, or do you want to learn more about? Well, I think what I really want to learn more about is. Uh, how was the deeper layer into the AI? What's the deeper layer of the artificial intelligence? Because I think right now as a designer, like all the workshop and the product we are seeing on the internet are really the applications that are built upon the really basic framework. I think in the future, probably as a designer, I want to participate more about building the fundamental framework of mm -hmm. the AI. And uh, I think that will be a new uh, trending that's going to change in the future. And I would say another part, like if like teaching the user to adopt a new technology, uh, personally, in my opinion, I think that has been happening all the time. If you go back to when the first computer invented and when the Pixar are using a computer to make the 3D animations, nobody adopt or trust uh, you know, computer can do 3D animation. Back then, everything's done by hand or on 2D is followed by the standard from Disney. And then today, when you're looking at the animation, everything's cool and 3D is done by computer. So I believe this thing will happen again when the next technology breakthrough happen. So that's basically what I believe. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my, ne <laughs> my next question is for Lionel. Um, so Lionel, uh, I love your idea of sort of a, a dating app for the electoral college. And I'm wondering where this idea of having a personal affinity for someone, um, as a way to better understand the electoral college came from. And I'm wondering how you might consider extending this data or this, um, dating app metaphor. Right. The project didn't always it uh, wasn't always a, a dating app. It, it began as kind of a, a Mad Libs to kind of generate a society in which the, the voting process shaped the way that the society forms. And I felt like it kind of evolved into this kind of dating app um, in, but through this kind of evolution of the, the iteration process. And I decided that it was kind of, the best way to to educate users in through developing these human relationships with them, um, and in terms of how further to how how, how to go further with it, um, I'd like to make it even more accessible by uh, post by publishing it on app stores and on on Slack. On Slack, you can have these custom bots that perform these. Um, fantasy things for you. Um, and I'd like to uh, port it to further, to make it more accessible for more, more people. Great, so it sounds like your idea, initial idea was to kind of use um, simulation and modeling to kind of represent what people, is that correct with the Mad Libs to kind of get inputs from them and say, based on what you inputted, this is what your ideal match would be. Is it like that? Yeah, that's pretty similar to what it was. And what was wrong with that was that 
it was very unregulated and the w- the input could be could be so such that the output wouldn't make any sense which had a mm. co- sort of comedic tone to it and it, I, I liked it for its comedy and it looked it was a great toy and world builder but in the end to educate people more i i, I focused on the relationship aspect of it i think that there's um some really interesting potential with that idea um, because right now it sounds like you've gone into this chat mode where you're just chatting with sort of one form of democracy. Um, and then you decide if you, you know, you learn about that. But I think that there's something else that's really interesting um, with the first idea. And I would, I'm sure you learned a lot through user testing, but um, potentially this idea of um, crafting your own ideal um, mate democracy mate, um, but also learning because there are lots of different forms of democracy throughout the world and they're um, executed differently. And it's really interesting to learn about how, you know, the way that Switzerland does it versus how we do it, but also how that might play out given the circumstances, the size of the United States, stuff like that. Um, I can see bringing back a little bit of that simulation um, uh, still being very fun and very interesting to find out given your situation what a good democracy mate for you is. Um, So thanks, and I look forward to seeing the evolution of your project. Thank you. My next question is for Akshansh. I think I said that correctly. Um, (laughs) I loved your uh, I loved your piece, both the video and sort of your um, almost like like a public service announcement mixed with an artist statement. So I feel like your work is, it's very interesting. It's kind of, in. it sounds like maybe you started with the idea that you were going to create an augmented reality or a virtual reality experience to teach people about privacy, but then it became and evolved very much into a form of personal expression. It sounds like you also might be emerging. Um, your identity as perhaps maybe a designer, artist is also transforming. So I'm curious about what's next for this work. Where do you see it going? Yeah, so uh, I want to highlight one thing that you said that it it did was about a PSA or something like an announcement or an awareness campaign almost when it started. But then gradually it became more of a personal identity, uh, specifically going to COVID where everything I drew was a reflective of how it gradually transitioned over things. And uh, with regards to the next uh, future iterations of this, I, uh, if you uh, you saw that it just had the main tech companies from the US, but my intention was to replicate the idea of being in the tech landscape or essentially sharing personal data with every other system that's associated, not just big companies, but so small as well, like uh, uh, Clearview AI that recently popped up in the media and so on and so forth. And not just for the West, but also for the East and Chinese companies and uh, uh, showing the entire landscape and then have people iterate over it and then reflect on it. So essentially installations on public spaces to have that kind of an accessibility uh, interaction is something where I perceive it to be. Very cool. So it's it's imagine you're imagining it as an immersive sort of art piece that's also critical and relevant about privacy issues. Right. Very cool. Very cool. Um, my next question is for Ming Ma. Uh, Ming, I'm super excited about your work as a musician and a creator of non-traditional instruments. I was absolutely delighted um, by the project and also your video is so cute. I love it. I love the style. Um, my question is, I know that you're you're targeting, I think it might be, I might be in your t- target user group a little bit, but I might be just outside of it. So I'm an adult. Um, I like music making toys. I'm also a person who actually like composes music. So um, I imagine that I might want to play with this and use it and then take the sounds that were created from or even like like some elements of what were created in my sculpture and take it and use it in another application. Do you see a future of extendability for Somata or does it just exist? Is it just gonna continue to exist as like a sculptural standalone play piece? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think in the future, maybe I will make the sound more like open source so people can uh, input any kind of sound they want. 
like uh, it's more like relate to themselves because um, each person's taste of uh, sound or music is very different. So uh, in the future, hopefully I want people can put the sound they desire into Sumata and they can use Sumata to create in any form they want and to play with any sound they want. That's exciting. I think in that world, um, there's a lot of, um, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of work that's done around creating like MIDI controllers or I think even sound objects where you can just give one sound. But I, I think an area to explore that I personally would love to see more is being able to define the relationships between two, three, four, five objects. So um, in your presentation, you mapped out how you were um, putting it, uh, creating the association between the pentatonic scale. So um, giving people different scales to choose from or even how scales can shift or, or perhaps create patterns in the way that the sounds are produced would be so super exciting. I would love to be a user tester. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and my last question is for Fan and Roy um, on Kaching. Hello. Um, your guys' project is so beautiful. The rendering is gorgeous. I assume that that must be one of the focus of your um, work. So it's really like the color, the, um, the, 3D, the 3D imagery. It's just so beautiful. Um, and so you guys have really clearly laid out this very detailed application. And I'm curious um, if you were in this work able to get um, feedback from users or if you were able to do user testing. Yeah, it's really hard to do user tests, especially during this period of time. So our user tests start from the first beginning, even from the wireframe. So we have done tons of like user research and just to narrow it down all the ideas into this final code. And we are willing to do like further research uh, after the whole things finished. Yeah. And, um, yeah, right, to solidify the whole idea and also concept as well, yeah. I can see that there might be some opportunities because I think a big part of your user research is really probably about adoption, right? Like hmm. the, Students have very little time, limited money, a lot of options in terms of apps and just shopping and distraction. So probably the biggest question I would want to know is like, well, what is it going to take for them to adopt and use this? And so I'm wondering if um, I think in that it might be sort of a product market fit. You guys might actually, if through just like um, interactive wireframes or whatever, um, be able to do that kind of user testing uh, remotely, which would be really interesting to find out because I think that you guys are proposing something that's possibly quite innovative and quite useful, but you want to make sure that, um, you know, that if there are things blocking it from being adopted, that you can find that out as soon as possible. Right, right, right. That sounds awesome. We're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fun, actually. You can do. I, I've been doing remote user testing. It's pretty. It's pretty useful. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Like the party time. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of stuff with Figma. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. I think I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, oh, you're good. <laughs> how much time do we have? Uh, we're technically over time, but so oh. Uh, ask another question if you have one. That was actually all the questions that I have. Oh, awesome. Well, I mean, thank you so much. I think uh, I'm going to probably conclude it for the night then. Um, thank you so much, Marika and Gwen. For it was my pleasure. You guys made my day. This is so awesome. Your work is really cool and inspiring and um it's a nice break from all of this pandemic madness. <laughs> <laughs>